Welcome to Cars on Call. I am automotive journalist Steve Schutz. I'm here with trauma surgeon Stefan Moran, and we have a special guest. Uh, it's a repeat guest, James Steele uh, of Bronco fame, and um, we talked a lot uh, about your Bronco, James, and then uh, about how you waited and then you got it, and you came on the show to talk about it. And little did we know, you'd be back to talk about a new Bronco. I'm going to surprise the audience with what that is, but you're going to talk about that, which is very exciting. I think it's awesome. We have trauma surgeon safety, of course, and we've got a little Mercedes to talk. We've got a, a the average car now, average new car is $47,000. We each pick, Stefan and I pick a car that we can buy for that much. And we're going to, we, we actually pick three cars, Stefan. And we're going to talk mobility as in not cars, as in helicopters and helicopter-like mobility devices. And um, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. Stefan, before we get into uh, the Raptor, you had a near-death experience. Yeah, I got a little bit of a rant here. Uh-oh. You know, Go for it. I'm a retired trauma surgeon. I was really good at bleeding, bleeding and dying. But this medicine shit, I don't understand. I've had a vaccine for 40 years for the flu. I go on vacation. I come home. I get sick as shit. Miss your son's wedding because I get influenza A. And uh, it was, it was me. I'm still recovering from it. But, you know, no, my wife didn't get it. None of my ski buddies got it, but I got it. And I've, you know, been in the military for a long time and all these vaccines. I know that, I know the, I know the, the virus mutates and all that. But boy, man, or maybe I'm just the weaker species. I don't know. But uh, it well, knocked me are, down bad. You are never the weaker species, but <laughs> <laughs> ever. But let me say this. When I was early in the Air Force, which would have been my 30s, I was really frustrated because I would get the, by the way, James, for you, in the in the military, you have to get these vaccines. You don't have a choice. Maybe they have a choice yeah. now. But when we were there, you just got the vaccines, whatever they gave you. I got the flu shot every year. And I seemed, I, I, I felt like I got the flu every year. I'm like, this is like, a, I got the placebo. Well, I mean, now I don't get the flu anymore because I keep on getting flu shots. For whatever reason, now it works. So I'm not surprised, Devon. Yeah, I know. I mean, they they have to the virus mutates so much, they kind of have to pick out what they think it's going to be. Mm-hmm. And clearly I didn't maintain immunity to this strain of influenza A. But I mean, they talk about, you know, you you hit you like a brick wall. And I was so sick, I didn't even think I had I thought I had I thought I had RSV, adult respiratory syncytial virus. Um, but anyway. Well, I'm getting better. I'm going to get on. I'm going to get on an airplane tomorrow against my own best advice and see you in Sun Valley and try to ski on Friday. <laughs> so that was you good know, over here, Stefan. You know, Stefan, uh, the viruses, these respiratory viruses, are getting a lot more virulent since they started making them in labs. <laughs> it may, it may be the fact when you're over sixty years old that may have something to do. But yeah, make making them in started uh-huh. making them in these labs. It's just it's been it's been a lot worse. <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right. So let's bring in James. Uh, James, welcome back. Oh, by the way, Thank for you. anyone who is, it, it, I know, I know, Adams would appreciate this. Adams has throngs of fans. We're hoping he's on every single show. Uh, those throngs will be highly disappointed. Uh, our best friend Adams Hudson is not here. Our collector connoisseur. Uh, I know he went to Amelia Island, so he's gonna. We're gonna hear about that, but he's not here. But we have James Steele. Uh, of Bronco fame. And James, uh, I'll let you talk about this because we went through the whole saga. You bought, you you, know, you ordered your Bronco. You waited, I think, two years for it. And then yeah. you surprised everybody. Talk about, you know, the like, remind our, we, our, our listeners what happened and then bring us to the next, I'm going to call it the next chapter of James Steele. Okay. Well, um, Appreciate being asked back. It's a real honor to be with my uh, my friends here on the podcast. I really in, enjoy this podcast, so it's fun to be back, guys. Thank you, um, Steve. Your facts are basically right. Uh, I, you know, did the factory order on the first Bronco, a two door hardtop, and as everybody might remember, those hardtops were really hard to get. They had a production issue with them. Right. Um, so I sat and sat and sat and wait, waited for my Bronco uh, rolls off the assembly line of almost two years after the original conversation and the deposit uh, was paid. 
So it was a very long process. Um, I did in the interim have a chance to go to the off rodeo event, which for any Bronco owners out there that haven't done that, you've got to do it. It's a fantastic experience. So I did get to drive around in one, but I didn't get to do it before I bought one. So when I ultimately took delivery, loved it. Absolutely fantastic. It's a very capable vehicle. And remind um, remind us when you took delivery. I mean, it's, you know, kind of when was, you ordered it and when it showed up. Yeah, it was February last year and we had ordered it December. I paid the deposit December two years earlier. So it was it was a while. <laughs> Um, but I, you know, there, there was that deposit period and then you actually had to go back into the dealership and spec it all out. And that's kind of when I started the two year clock, it was about two years from the time I specced it out and placed all the, the final orders in there. So, uh, I got it February of last year, put about 4,900 miles on it. Um, I don't drive a lot, uh, but so I had 4,900 miles on it and, you know, loved lots of aspects to it, but my life is fairly gear intensive at times. <laughs> I ski, I play golf, uh, got some things to throw in the back, uh, scuba tanks, things like that. And I found that that two-door Bronco was great to ride around with a driver and a passenger. But if you had a lot of gear, you were folding down the rear seats, trying to get things to go in there. If you didn't fold down the rear seats, there just wasn't very much cargo capacity. I mean, really minimal, <laughs> maybe a couple small suitcases and that was it. But certainly if you wanted to put a set of skis in there, you had to lay down the seats and, and it would go almost all the way up to uh, to the cup holders uh, from the back. So not a lot of not a lot of space in there. So the ride uh, was another issue. Um, it's bumpy. You know, that short wheelbase, uh, it is a bumpy ride. It's better than I had expected having a big off-road vehicle like that. I mean, it was pretty nice, but when I got in the new version, uh, which we'll talk about it, there was quite a contrast just, I mean, night and day in terms of the ride. So that's kind of the, the old Bronco story. You know, it was a silver and black with the Sasquatch package, 35 inch tires on it, did everything I wanted it to do. Just not the most comfortable ride, not a lot of storage space. So that's kind of the summary. So then all of a sudden you said less is more, but in this case, more is more. <laughs> more is more. So I show up at our uh, local Ford dealer and it happens to be one of the few in the country that has a Bronco a building. So it's one of these dedicated Bronco selling facilities and they have a bunch of Broncos out there now. And we were out there for another reason, but I happened to see they had a few Raptors out there. Uh, I had cut two Raptors, I should say. They had a white one, uh, which had some very, I would just call them oddball trim features that I didn't really like. But then they happened to have the clone of mine, just the big brother, silver and black, absolutely beastly looking, sitting out there in the sunshine. So I'm, you know, working my way around the lot and, and figuring out. I might want to test drive this thing just for fun, not having any idea that I was going to upgrade that day. Yeah. What could happen, right? It's just yeah. a test drive. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, you know, so we go through the the process of, of, uh, of test driving this thing. And I, I drive around a little bit with my wife. We take it up and down one of the major arterials near the dealership. And I'm like, wow, this thing is pretty cool. I might have to take it down and, and see if it actually fits in my garage. I live in a condominium building uh, for your listeners. And, you know, these spaces aren't luxuriously sized, but they're decent size. And you can see it sitting here. It's it's in my spot and I've got six inches of room on each side. So it's good. I can get in and out of the door. So, it, you know, I also flagged my friend Steve-O to see if he wanted to go for a test drive with me. He did. Uh, which is which was very helpful, Steve. I really appreciated your input on it. <laughs> yeah. But driving this thing around, I mean, the ride was significantly smoother. Uh, and the interior is night and day. They really have spent a lot of money on the interior on the Raptor. Uh, it has very nice seats. Um, the original Bronco uh, that I had ordered basically just had front and back and a little crank so you could lift it up or, or lower it down a little bit, but it certainly wasn't the multi-function adjustable seats that I've become used to in other more luxury cars, shall we say. So very comfortable interior, 
you're seeing the suede seats here, suede line Raptor seats. They're very comfortable. Uh, they just kind of wrap around you. Not quite like a Recaro seat, but it's getting there. It's a sportier ride for sure. Those Raptor um, seats have ball coolers. They don't. Stop. Oh I man! Thought of you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no ball coolers, unfortunately, but they do have very nice heated seats and a heated steering wheel. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're good in the winter, but not so much in the summer. I guess in the summer, the answer is just take the entire upper shell off and, and let the hair blow in the wind. So another picture of the interior. I like the graphics that pop up when you turn the key on originally. I wasn't able to capture that on this image, but it's got a nice Raptor logo and it's uh it's a fully digital dashboard, a uh, nice 12 inch LCD screen. You got your little goat mode dial there on the lower right hand side. All your window controls are in the control panel because you can take the doors off. If you're out, out there in the Baja and want to have all your doors off, they don't recommend you do that in town because of safety. Um, but you can certainly take the doors off. So they put all the window controls on that con on that side panel. So what's your take home? I mean, obviously, it's it's more expensive. I would think that the biggest change would be the power. It is the three liter. So my old one, I upgraded to the 2.7 liter V6. They're both Eco, EcoBoost V6 engines. So it's three liters versus 2.7. Uh, it's a little uptick. In my future, I may be helping my children, you know, moving stuff. So it's got some towing capacity that my old one didn't. It's up to 4,000 pounds of towing capacity in this thing. It's uh, you know, it's a much more capable towing vehicle than my other one was. It actually has this, a tow function in this, the goat modes. Is that the same engine that's in the F one fifty Raptor? I'm assuming it is. Stefan might know because I know you're specking one of those out, Stefan, but I'm not sure. Yeah, honestly, I don't. I don't know. You talking about the the F one fifty Raptor, Steve? Yeah, yeah. The the regular yeah, I one. I assume it's the same engine. It makes sense. Um, there is the Raptor R, which is the V8, but the standard F-150 Raptor is, is the is the same EcoBoost V6. I think it's a three liter. I'm not sure about that. I'm sure one of our listeners will let us know. Yeah, it sounds familiar because I know when I was talking about the towing capacity with my salesperson, he mentioned that they have lowered the towing capacity in the user's manual for the Raptor, but it, it should basically tow what an F-150 would, even mm -hmm. though they don't say it in your user's manual. So um, overall, better ride, nicer interior, and more power, and a satisfied James Steele. Yes. Uh, I will add one <laughs> other thing, because yeah. part of the calculus in here was what the old one was worth. And I listened to your episode recently on depreciation, and I was very happy with how this one turned out, because in a, an entire year, I only lost about $2,500 versus what I paid on it. Wow, wow, that's a great deal. 200 yeah. bucks a month to drive that. Yep. Yeah. Or you usually lose at least 20% and just drive off the lot. Um, but I got a couple of comments. So I did look it up. The the F-150 hat Raptor has a 3.5 okay. V6. Oh, okay. And then, yeah, we, we talked about in the last show, when we knew you are buying this, We I talked about the wheelbase. I had an old CJ7. And you drove a CJ5, which is even shorter wheelbase than the CJ7. Those are Jeeps, if you don't know. Not Jeeps. I'm just I'm talking about the short wheelbase. Yeah, it was amazing. Right. It's amazing what, you know, 10 inches, 12 inches or more of wheelbase will do, especially on a vehicle like this that's got these, you know, tall 36-inch tires in a uh, super short wheelbase. So, Yeah, they're actually 37s, Stefan. 37s, holy mackerel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a lot of rubber on the road. I know the guys that have the F-150 Raptors say it, it rides even better than the regular F-150s because you just got all that tire and it's got the softer suspension and um, really, really nice vehicle. Yeah, and if I ever have the occasion to roll over some rocks, I know I have a very thick steel plate that runs under almost the entire vehicle. So Yeah, so there you go. I also listen to your segments on safety, and I think I'm going to win the mass contest with that one versus what I've yeah. done before, too. And yeah. A steel plate. It is. I tell you, I love these Raptors. And, um, you know, the F-150 Raptor, one of my neighbors has one, one of our neighbors, James, and uh, I drive it about once a week because he wants me to get some miles on it and keep it going. I, every time I get into that truck, I love it. I love everything about those Raptors. So we'll see. 
Anyway, uh, cool. We're going to move on. And um, the next thing we want to talk about is in 2023, in the luxury new car sales race or new vehicle sales race, uh, it's typically Mercedes BMW 1, 2, and they switch back and forth. But that's typically the way it's been for the last 10 years. And this last year in 2023, it was BMW number one, Lexus number two, and, and Mercedes was really kind of you know hanging back. And we have talked about this, but a lot of the reason is their electric vehicles, which are not selling. So there's two reasons that the, the company has said, all right, we need to change things. One is they, they went too far, too fast with BEVs, number one. And then number two, they just had a lot of expensive cars, you know, the emphasis on the S class, the GLS, their high, uh, high cost cars. And this year, they, what they want to do is they want to be, you know, closer uh, to number one or number two. They don't want to be kind of a distant third, which is where they are. And by the way, Audi's catching up. So what they did was they said, all right, we're going to make these changes. Well, go ahead and uh, step on and show the, the picture. I've been beating this drum and I will continue to beat this drum. There is a problem with their electric vehicles. They want them to be fuel efficient, so therefore they're aerodynamic, but they don't have presence. That has presence. Okay, that's the S-Class, the internal combustion engine, Mercedes S-Class. Anybody would agree that has presence. When I've driven these cars, people tend to get out of the way. It's almost like you pull up behind somebody and they move over because, oh my gosh, there's somebody important coming through. You do not get that. I've driven uh, the EQS SUV, and it's embarrassing. The, the, the sedan is even worse. The sedan came up behind me once, and this is last year, and I there it is. I thought it was a Hyundai. It, it, mm. If you took the badges off this, there's no way you'd think it was a Mercedes. That's the problem. So they, what they did was they're like, all right, we want to make sure people know it's a Mercedes. So they put this huge badge on the front and rear. It's, you know, compensating for the lack of presence. There's the SUV too. Same thing, a big, I just think this is terrible. They have announced that they're going to change the grills to make it more like the S-Class, but these cars are not really going to have much presence. Stefan, come on. This is like, isn't this like ridiculous? What you have is a traditional automotive manufacturer trying to enter the BEV market, you know? And these electric vehicles that are come out like the Lucid and the Tesla and Hyundai's done a fantastic job with their EVs. Everybody expects an EV to be something different from what we think of as a traditional four door sedan. It's got to look special. It's got to be different. And right. Mercedes completely missed the mark with the EQS. I mean, that is the, that is the goofiest, ugliest looking car the waistline where the windows are, the whole thing is just completely off. And they are ridiculously expensive on top of that way overpriced for what they are. And then the sedan looks like a half ass effort at a BEV. So, but you know, it's not kind of surprising from a stodgy old German manufacturer, Mercedes, who's, you know, your traditional manufacturer trying to do something, add some flair to something. And they, you know, they, they got just, you got to start with a brand new design sheet. They tried, but it didn't work. And you're right. You see an S class. It's like, you know, the dude or the, the gal driving it, they've made it. They're, they're successful. Right. And that's what you expect out of a high end Mercedes and that EQS. I mean, I saw one of those, the same thing. It's like, you know, what is it, you know, I'm the love child of a, of a Prius and a Mercedes or something. I don't know what it is. It's just yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. It's one hundred twenty thousand dollars. It's it's ridiculous. James, you must have thoughts about this. I'm, I I can't be the only one that looks at this and says, "Come on, this is not good." It, it just doesn't inspire me. That's all I'm going to say. It it I completely agree with you, Steve. I mean, look how low the d listeners. If you get on a picture, the door handle is like. It looks like it's a foot lower than the window sill where the window comes up. I mean, who puts a door handle down that low? Just the whole thing is just weird. They, I guess they try to line it up with the electrical port. I don't know. Are those but, retractable door handles? Do you know? Yeah. I mean, like, do yes. they go inside? But it's, yeah, it's. They, they do. And that's for aerodynamics, James. So, so it's yeah. flush. And the idea is that it's going to, you know, cheat the wind more. I mean, they really made this thing aerodynamic. 
But again, if you finally make it, you finally have money, you're finally like, okay, I can get a Mercedes. You want a car that it, it, it sparks, you know, you talk about sparking joy, right? You get rid of stuff if it doesn't spark joy. Well, a luxury vehicle and a luxury product, you know, like a Prada bag or something, it should spark desire. No one desires this. Nope. And what's it going to be worth in two years is the question. Oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's going to be like a Tycon. It's going to, it's going to drop in, in value. Like in 80, yeah, down 80, yeah, 80% in this watch. They won't yeah. be able to sell these. Yeah, that's, yeah, these, that's, these, that's exactly right. So uh, I hope Mercedes uh, rethinks this. I think they are already, I think certainly been hearing from the dealers. Automotive News has been talking about that. Dealers are saying, listen, we can't sell these cars. Nobody wants them. So they have to lease them, but they're not getting a lot of help from, from Mercedes North America to give it a, a low lease payment. And of course, that's not helped by uh, inflation and high interest rates. So this is a problem they're going to have to solve. But if they listened to our show, they would have solved it you know, last year. <laughs> Stefan, on to safety. We're going to revisit, you know, this, on the previous episodes, I talked about pedicyclist, and that's not, that's, a term I came up, there's pedal cyclist. And that is anybody that's, you know, on a, a bicycle. But I use the word pedicyclist, which includes pedestrians and cyclists. And their fatalities went way up. But we know from 2020, 2022, that fatal car accidents also went up by 10%. And there was a recent um, article published by Forbes Advisor. And they did a deep dive data in the um, looking at fatality rates. And what they wanted to look at was which cities have the worst drivers and the most fatalities. And really what this comes down to a lot of this research is you ask, why would somebody want to know which cities and, or publish articles about which cities have the highest fatality rates, which states, things like that? Well, this is all data that can use, be used by insurance companies to schedule various rates. So if you wonder why you moved from Birmingham, Alabama to Albuquerque, New Mexico and your insurance rates went up. Well, here's a reason why. It's the same thing when they have data on BEVs involved in frontal collisions. You know that if you hit the front of a BEV with all its radar and all those things, it's a lot more expensive to repair than a non-BEV um, because technology is more expensive. So anyway, so Forbes did this deep dive. And what they looked at, they looked at the top 50 most populated cities across the country. And they looked at five metrics. And what they're looking at when they talk about a metric, that means there's a number and a top a number, a top number and a bottom number, numerator, denominator. So these are all looking at rates per hundred thousand city residents. So they looked at distracted driving, alcohol, speeding, fatal accidents, and then occupant fatalities per fatal crash. Because sometimes, unfortunately, in a crash, more than one person dies. So you look at a fatal accident and then the number of deaths per fatal accident. It's two different metrics. So a uh, key, couple key takeaways. I'm going to bring up a slide here. We'll go over this. Here we go. I'm going to share that. So a couple key takeaways. Albuquerque, New Mexico, is top of the list city. Um, sorry, tops the list of all cities. The worst drivers uh, were in Albuquerque. It had the worst statistics all over and got the worst rating. Number two was Memphis, Tennessee, then Detroit, Tucson, and then Kansas City, Missouri. Three of the top 15 cities with the worst drivers are located in Texas, Dallas, Fort Worth, and San Antonio. Those are large populations. I'd imagine that has to do something with the, you know, could be with the SUV, F-150 truck predominance and that large vehicles. And we know with trucks, there's different behaviors as well. Three of the top 10 cities with the best drivers are in California. I guess those are all the people out there driving Teslas, you know, trying to be good stewards of the environment in San Francisco, open San Diego. And then the highest number of DUI, drunk alcohol related fatalities with Memphis, Tennessee. So I guess they're really singing the blues down there in Memphis over that. Oh, oh bad pun. I know. Anyway, <laughs> but then <laughs> these statistics are rather interesting and it kind of makes you take away why, you know, why do you see this, these certain behaviors more in these cities than other, you know, they don't do that, that deep dive into that kind of thing. But I, I find this data interesting. We'll go a little bit. Um, I want to talk a little bit about 
more about Albuquerque. So they did it. They had the highest number of fatal car accidents involving a distracted driver. Third highest total number of fatal accidents. Third highest number of people killed in fatal crashes. They're the fifth highest in speeding, so not not terribly high, and the sixth highest in DUI. So what this mm. look at this data. Here's how I look at it. You know, you'd think alcohol would be number one. You think speeding would be number two, but no, it's distracted driving is right there at the top. Wow. They were the highest in Albuquerque, they were the highest in distracted driving deaths. Um, and then the others came along. So something about, you know, people in Albuquerque and, and a lot of um distracted driving. So what this kind of, you know, what this kind of data kind of, I look at this and think about this is you're talking about people that are speeding, people that are distracted and people that are driving under the influence. So I talk about, you know, everybody says you should be a defensive driver. I know you've heard this from me before, but I say, oh, hell no, I'm not going to be a defensive driver. I'm going to be on the offense. I'm like that linebacker carrying the ball. Everybody out there is trying to kill me. If you drive purely defensively, and to me, d defensive driving implies passivity behind the wheel. That you're just minding your own business. You're going real careful. No, you need to be driving that car like everybody out there is trying to kill you. You know, but when the light turns green, you look left and right because there could be that person on the cell phone that blows through the intersection. Unfortunately, you're coming home from work from the late night shift. You be need to be looking out for drunks out on the road. And I don't mean being a jerk when I say be an offensive driver. You're on the offense. You're like an offensive lineman. So you're going to, that's why we see these higher rates in these areas. And in these areas, you know, especially I think anytime you're driving in a new city, you need to up your game. You need to be more aware of what's going on around you. But definitely if these cities are on your list of where you live, you're going to visit. <laughs> I'd be especially careful because the statistics, they're, they're way outside of the norm of everywhere else in the country. It's interesting to see, um, to look at this data and we can always kind of think about it. But it makes you wonder what's going on and out there in Albuquerque. Yeah. Hey, Stefan, uh, of course, everyone hears Albuquerque, you think breaking bad. Uh, <laughs> there so you go. They're not, they're not drunk. They're a mess. <laughs> but you know, one thing I, I wondered about Stefan, and I don't know if you have data on this, but we know that the average age of the fleet in the United States, in other words, if you look at all the cars in the United States, the average age is 12 years old. That is an old car. And that means, of course, there's a lot of cars that are 20 or 30 years old. Those are old cars without good safety. Could the age of the cars, the average car in like Albuquerque, could the age of those cars be older than cars in other areas where they're safer? I would think one of the reasons that California has, has done better is may, I think they have newer cars. You know, Tesla, if you have a Tesla, it's pretty new. Right. So um, actually, Albuquerque is number eight in the country on the average, average vehicle age is 7.2. I looked it up, did not bring that up the top of my head. And of course, California is down the list. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. You know, it's a, that's a good point. It makes you wonder what what's going on out there. But clearly something's going on. <laughs> I don't know that's, what it is. <laughs> Welcome to life, Stefan. That's life, man. I can't on. explain everything. Can, can right, I ask well, a question you. here? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you've talked in the past, Stefan, about the traffic calming ideas that, mm. uh, you know, Europe in particular has implemented where we haven't. Is, is there any correlation to that in some of these regional differences, do you think? Do you have any data on that? I don't have any current data. I don't. I don't know of any data. Um, I know the European data clearly shows that it works, and there have been limited studies in the U.S. that I've talked about previously on the show where the cities did calming traffic calming. And so, listeners, traffic calming means where you make where you get into congested areas where there's more cars, where you have pedestrians, more shopping. They do things to the road system to purposely slow people down. So they'll make the roads narrower. They'll put in medians with plants. They'll um, put in traffic circles. So everything I did is, you know, because if you got a big city, and Albuquerque may be like this, where you've got basically, you know, this these five five lane byways. So it's a five lane road with a speed limit of thirty five and forty. Well, people are naturally doing; they're going faster than that. And there's a lot of traffic lights. There's pedestrians. There's people turning in and out of parking lots, but. Yes, traffic calming, James, great comment. 
in Europe, it absolutely works. And it, it's pretty impressive to see how they do it over there. You know, your initial impression is kind of a pain in the ass because it makes you slow down and the road gets narrow. And there's not a lot of places to park, but it also makes you slow down and enjoy the scenery. But in you know, America, we like our big open roads. and But our cities that have expanded that have these type roads have high fatality rates. But yeah, traffic calming, that would probably be a good point for them to start. Yeah, I, uh, this is unscientific, but in all of the Breaking Bad episodes, I did not see any <laughs> traffic calming changes. <laughs> no. I, <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. The next thing I want to talk about, I, I want to get James uh, James's input on this because this is something we both experienced. And I, I thought of this because Automotive News had a very interesting article, and they said, that Toyota, Stellantis, and Mercedes are investing in companies that do vertical takeoff and landing. In other words, uh, basically a large drone that you can sit in and it takes you somewhere and it's all autonomous. The classic company that everyone thinks of for that is Joby. And what Joby's developing is these six, eight, or 10 passenger drones that go from one docking station to another. And it's interesting to think about that in theory, but I experienced something like this in real life. Um, I was in New York City, uh, probably, I don't know, I guess it was last summer. I was in New York City and going from Manhattan to Newark Airport sucks. There, You have to go through a tunnel. There's usually an accident somewhere. There's traffic, there's rush hour. It is nasty. And it's, you know, 20 minutes if there's nothing happening or no traffic, which is like never or it can be 45 minutes or an hour. It just, it's so unpleasant. And my son, Carl said, Hey, you know, they have a helicopter service called blade. So I thought, all right, I'm going to try this. And it was definitely a splurge, but it wasn't crazy expensive. It was like, okay, yeah, I can do that. And I got into this helicopter, a couple other passengers with me. Um, you know, they just kind of load up the thing with four to six people and I was there in seven minutes. It was the best thing in the world. So imagine a Joby shuttle. Of course, there's no driver. It's not a helicopter. It's going to be a lot cheaper. And it goes from a, a pad. It's going to be the same area, the west uh, side of, of Manhattan, downtown. And it goes to Newark. And it'll take seven minutes. I mean, it's so great. So I think Joby and these vertical takeoff and landing companies, I think that's the future. And James, you've experienced something like this. What do you, I mean, am I wrong? I agree a hundred percent. It takes me back to a lecture I attended once um, that was comparing our traditional system of roads and highways to a three-dimensional system where you are able to, you know, literally use the airspace above us for transit instead of being bottlenecked in all these places. And, you know, you don't have to think about too many big cities where this would be a really big advantage. Um, but I, I absolutely think, I mean, the capacity increases alone are exponential over what we have today. And you don't have to worry about, you know, the random dog or small child or whatever it is running into your path when you're up in three dimensional space. So, yeah, I, I think it's, you know, it requires testing. Uh, I don't want to be um, the beta version <laughs> tester on this. Oh, you, Elon Musk will take care of that. Don't worry about that. <laughs> so. You know, safety is everything in these vehicles when you suspend them from the air like that. But uh, yeah, I think it's a wonderful idea. Yeah, Stefan, what about the safety? I mean, don't you think these will be safer? Because again, there's not a human driver that can fall asleep. It's just going back and forth one dock to another. And we have the technology for this. Yeah, and then Amazon, the Amazon, the little Amazon delivery copter will get in your pathway. You know, I don't know that our airspace is highly regulated by the FAA. And if you look at helicopter transport, especially in the medical side of the world, a lot of helicopters go down in medical transport. And it's a whole different kind of aviation from versus fixed wing. They're just not, they, they, you know, they just, when they go down, they go down, they can't glide. But here, you're, you know, I think it's going to have to, I think it's a great idea. I'd love it, especially if I had to do this and I lived in the big city, but as we move, you know, we can't even get towards autonomy on our highways. You know, we already have pretty much autonomous flight with our jet airplanes, all our commercial planes. They're they're doing instrument, you know, the right. whole way. Every so it's 
pretty autonomous and is highly regulated. I think this, as they we enter into this world of transportation with these, uh, I should hope that the FAA is already going to be involved with this um, from the, the get go. And it's, I think it's going to be a, a lot bigger hurdle to get past than on our roads. I think I, the road thing, I, I, I agree, Stefan. And, and of course, those are all uh, challenges and concerns. But all those helicopter, every single helicopter trip really is a different trip. Here, we're talking the same thing back and forth. This is like a ferry. Shuttle, right. You don't hear about ferries crashing. And if it does, it's a two-dimensional thing where it hits another boat and it's a human driver. So I think the fact that it's it's you know it uses all that that kind of autopilot technology and it's just one trip back and forth like the same thing every day. I think that makes it safe. And James, you've you've had a helicopter experience and and I think you liked it too. I loved it. Mine was a little different than yours. It was more for pleasure than for for commuting to an airport. But uh, yeah, point A to point B through the, through the air in a helicopter is is so efficient. Uh, mine was in Switzerland, uh, getting to the top of a ski hill, so it, it was it was a pretty nice way to go. Uh, instead of taking the taxi or the bus through uh, St. Moritz, it was you could take the helicopter from the helipad straight to the top of the mountain. I thought that was a pretty good idea. Yeah, and of course, Stefan, as you know, there's there's weather concerns and that sort of thing. But oh my gosh, if it if they can if they can kind of limit the weather and say, okay, during good weather we'll fly, and again back and forth, I think the safety thing will be pretty minimal. Um, I certainly hope so. But I feel like I just like when I rode in the Waymo car in San Francisco, I feel like I've kind of glimpsed the future. Oh no, I think so. I think I think clearly it's going to be part of the future, the uh, transportation future. For, right, the, want, for the wealthy. Yeah. 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 But again, it's going to get cheaper. Like everything, yep. it's kind of democratized. Um, so the average new car sold for about $47,000 in 2023. It's kind of hovering there. You know, it kind of, it doesn't go up in a linear fashion. It kind of goes up and then sits for a while. It seems like it's been sitting uh, at 47000 I bet that it'll stay at 47000 over the next year or so because people are just not in the mood to buy expensive cars like they were in, you know, 22 or something dur during the pandemic when the whole YOLO thing was going on. So I thought, you know, it would be fun to just pick three cars that caught, you can get for $47,000 or less. And uh, Jeff Bank, of course, my partner uh, is so active in coming up with ideas and helping us that I asked him to come up with three. So I'll, I'll say his three, but Stefan, go ahead and tell us your, your uh your three and um james you can chime in too you can you can say if you like it or not i'm gonna i certainly will <laughs> all right here we go i'm gonna do so i did this i did this as i picked out a truck an suv and a sedan for forty seven thousand. Yeah. so i picked out one from each category so of course you know there's a ford in the mix so here it is this is the ford ranger and i could get the super crew cab with the lariat package in this price range it comes in right at about 47 so that would be my choice for a truck in that price range. I'm a Ford guy, and I, I think the Ranger is a fantastic truck. I, um, you know, I think it's a great pick, Stefan. I, I love the I love the Ranger, as you know. But oh my gosh, they need to make more Rangers and Mavericks because if you go to a Ford dealership, you're going to see a lot of loaded F-150s, and they are not going for forty-seven thousand dollars. They're going for sixty, eighty, sometimes a hundred thousand dollars. Oh yeah, I know my. I said it before. My XLT F one hundred and fifty that I've got now, mine's mine is fourteen years old, uh, brand new, and it's like sixty five thousand dollars. It's for, it's with a cloth yeah. interior. And James, I bet you can get a James. Can you get a strip Bronco with a four cylinder? You think for forty seven? Uh, you could probably get the Big Bend. Um, would be my guess for that price. I think you could. So here I wanted this. This will give me the luxury four door. So this is just a, you know, this is a very nice vehicle that's a very, you know, you can use it like a car. You can use it like a truck. It's got a decent towing capacity. So this would definitely be my pick. So, and then. And the Maverick's even cheaper. Yeah. Yeah, but they have, there's no towing capacity in the Maverick. It's like a thousand. That's why I wouldn't want it. You can't tow anything with it. Yeah. And the payload is terrible. Yeah, but Maverick, you're right, is, is dirt cheap. But that to me really is. I really, I know, I wouldn't really call that a truck. 
it's it's more like a Subaru Brat, you know, the old Brat day. It's a it's a, a Ute kind of uh, Australian kind of Ute vehicle. Um, yeah, we have to we have to wait for the Maverick Raptor. There we go. <laughs> I and really then, like that first pick, Stefan. You know, yeah. it's a major utility car because you get four adults in there. Plus, you can haul your gear in the back if you want to. It just checks a lot of boxes. Absolutely. That's why I picked this four wheel drive, too. So I thought that was a good deal. And then we talked about this on a recent show. Oh, yeah. The new 2020. This is my SUV pick. The new 2024 uh, Hyundai um, Santa Fe. This thing is absolutely gorgeous. I saw a truckload of them uh, headed up I-65. They're built down south of Montgomery. I saw them coming up. And uh, now, of course, I would not want these queasy nar designed rims on this thing. <laughs> Um, I mean, these, I don't know what the hell these things are on this thing, but Hyundai's on a complete roll. The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety gave them the most awarded automaker for safety innovation for 2024. They've got more vehicles with safety, top safety picks than anybody else. Um, so IHS really gave a big round of applause to Hyundai. So that would be my choice. And then I know it's kind of crazy here. I'm sticking in the, in the whole Hyundai Kia thing, but Hey, before you get, before you yeah. move on, when we were kids, there were American cars made in Detroit and there were foreign cars made in Japan or some other place. How funny is it that there's a lot of American nameplate cars made in Mexico or okay. Canada and yeah. here is a quote unquote foreign car, a Hyundai, and it's made in Alabama. Yeah. And pretty much you know, the way that it's assembled in Alabama of domestic parts but you know it's like the ford does it with in mexico so i like what they did with the roof line on that thing is you know it's very range rover sport mm -hmm. it's got a little range rover sport look to it yeah. and uh i look great on it looked great going down the highway up on loaded up on the semi truck going out for delivery but those I wheels saw one on the road a couple of days ago i saw one on the road it looked beautiful and the interior is spectacular so i'm still so i'm thinking of forty seven thousand dollars I want my money's worth and I want a luxury sedan. And this reminded me of, you know, the act, we talked about the Acura legend when it came out that realigned the luxury four door sedan market expectations. And for me, you know, that's here it is right here. This is the um, Genesis G 70 and you can get, you can get this, um, with the 2.5 motor all-wheel drive, the Sport Prestige package. It has forward collision avoidance assistance, lane keeping, lane following, driver attention warning, blind spot, rear cross traffic, rear view camera, safe exit warning, rear occupant alert, and parking distance warning. All those safety features and wrapped up in a great looking four-door sedan, amazing interior, $47,000. Wow. I mean... I mean, look at that car and that blue. That's exactly the color I'd get. What a fantastic color. I mean, the, the, and you know, we've talked about it. They're on a design roll. Look at those five spoke rims. Yeah. I mean, that car is gorgeous. And for $47,000, I don't think there's anything else that touches it for that, that amount of vehicle. Yeah, I, I agree. That's a great choice. Um, I actually tried to spec a three series, get a 330i. Uh, for 47 and I couldn't didn't do it. Yeah. It starts above. And if you kind of take your hands and you put it over the grill of that car and the headlights, it, you know, you could definitely say it looks a lot like a three series. It's certainly the same size, obviously a competitor, but all those safety features, there's luxury features that are included. This is a, this is a very good deal. It's a fantastic deal. And you know, great warranty as well. So, and one of my partners, Pro Partners has the Genesis SUV and and it, it's just gorgeous inside and out. Well built, solid. Um, James, what are your thoughts about Genesis? I mean, or Hyundai. I mean, the, the, we all remember the Hyundai XL from the eighties. It was a joke. It was so bad. Those those days are over. Yeah, I think they're very legitimate cars these days, from what I'm seeing on the roads. And I really like this one. It looks like they stretch the wheelbase on it. I bet it rides very smoothly. And there isn't much back end in there. I'm not sure how much you cargo capacity you would have in there, but you know, I, the stance of that thing just sitting on the road looks very solid to me. I agree. You know, I agree with that. And you know, that that whole thing where you've got not much overhang front and rear is very BMW three series. So mm -hmm. anyway, um, I'll go with mine. I have talked 
recently about how much I loved the Volkswagen GTI. It was my first new car in 1984 after I got my Air Force, scale, Air Force scholarship, scholarship to medical school. So I just went with the GTI. You could have gotten a Golf R. That's what Jeff Bank picked a Golf R. And you can barely sneak in for 47 for a Golf R. But I just said, you know, I'm going standard GTI. I wanted to get white over black, manual transmission. And I got the, the Autobahn package, which gives you some extra bells and whistles. Because this car starts, you can get a GTI for like 32 grand. So even if you load it up, you're under 40. So just for nostalgia, just because I love GTI, as always have, that would be my pick for number one. The second car, I was certain Stefan would pick this. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was yeah. certain. Uh, five liter oh. Mustang GT. Uh, Stefan, you did not know this, uh, but James Steele traded in a uh it's a, a shelby mustang uh gt500 i think right right yep. james yeah the gt500 svt with a manual yes with a manual so i would get this with a manual and um in real life i'd, I'd stretch up to the mach one because you get the better tremec uh, six speed but that's too expensive you can get one of these. I think it's, I looked it up. It's like $44,000 with the six speed. So that's my choice. And yes, so what, I'm, what I'm seeing here in these, what I'm seeing here in these picks though, Steve, is this is like single doc. This is like single Steve on residency with 47,000. This is not Steve with a family recommendation. <laughs> this is Steve coming up on retirement with an empty nest. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. That, that'll take, uh, that'll take because yeah, these, these choices are great. Yeah. You know, maybe to put somebody else in the front seat, but not going on a big trip or anything like that. Oh, or, a big trip with this and it's going to yeah. be orange. Yeah. Okay. Orange on black. Seriously. Yeah. This is empty nest heaven. Love, uh, love enjoy that it. Yeah. Enjoy it before you get grandkids. So those are my two first picks. And my last one, this is going to win. It's going to win uh, the whole contest. There is a dealership in Alabama. I think it's called Town and Country. And they are selling a Ford F-150 sleeper package. It's got 700 horsepower. It is stripped otherwise. $45,000. 700 horsepower. This is the greatest truck ever made in the history of mankind. What what is this? I've never. What is this, <laughs> Steve? You'd have to put a thousand pounds of sand in the back to keep those tires on the pavement. Oh, I don't. I, I want them to spin, James. <laughs> oh my gosh! So what they're doing, listeners? Uh, I'm I'm reading here. I just saw they're basically putting. They're taking a stripped down two door pickup truck, the work truck with steelies and everything, and they're putting a supercharger motor on it what they're doing that's incredible v8 it's a five but the route supercharger oh my okay. gosh <laughs> where, where did you find this i saw it I, i'm always getting in, in info well i think i found this on on instagram to be honest but i found this i'm like this is the greatest thing of all time <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. A total stripper. I wonder wow. if it even has air conditioning. Probably not. That's yeah. Bad. Well, guess what? Don't we all love strippers? Anyway, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> this is the one. I'm like, this is this would be so I mean, imagine, yeah, you you'd have to if you're gonna really drive it, you, you need some weight in the back. But just imagine you're sitting next to, you know, a Porsche at the at a red light and you just take off. <laughs> I bet it has a pretty throaty exhaust system too for that engine. Oh yeah. I mean, absolutely. <laughs> All right, Steve, oh, you win. I, I give it to you. You win on that one. I just, when I initially saw that, I didn't even, I didn't even read the headline. I just saw the picture of the red truck and it's a total stripper work truck. I mean, you know, as bottom line as it gets. And then I, now I see the sleeper package, 700 <laughs> horsepower. My gosh. I'm telling you, I think it's absolutely fantastic. And uh, this is like, uh, for all those people that want to go electric, you go electric. But I'm going in a different direction. There yep. we go. 
All right. Uh, Jeff also said he wanted a Miata Club and a Toyota GR86, so a couple of sports cars for for uh, for Jeff. Uh, knowing Jeff, they were manuals. But um, that's it. That closes us out. That is another episode done. And uh, Adams, Hudson, we miss you. And uh, James, thank you for, for coming on. And Stefan, go ahead and close us out. All right, listeners. Um, thanks for tuning in. And sorry I'm a little bit under the weather this week, but hopefully a couple days in Sun Valley and I'll be feeling much better. <laughs> we'll see about that. And uh, remember to like, listen, subscribe, hit that bell button on YouTube, tell your friends about us. And uh, we all three should be back next week. See you later.